Testing, testing. Testing, testing. It helps if I unmute. Yes, I can hear you. Did you hear me, Andrew? Yes, thank you, Candy. Okay.
meeting to order. Welcome everybody to the Board of Commissioners meeting for May 4th, 2022. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next, we will have the roll call. Commissioner Beeman. Present. Commissioner Hodge. Present. Commissioner Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Labar. Present. Commissioner Maciejewski. Present. Commissioner Morgan. Present. Commissioner Sanders. Present. Commissioner Scott. Present. Commissioner Schenck. Present. Thank you, we have a quorum. Thank you. Next, we will commence with public participation. Each person gets three minutes. We have a little um, light on the podium and green says you have plenty of time. Yellow says it's almost time to finish and red means please, please finish so that other people can have their turn. Please um, step forward and, and give, give everybody plenty of space. Uh, we can all take our turns. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Hello. My name is Teacher Barton, and my current representative is CM Morgan. I'm a tax paying property owner, native son of Washtenaw County. I'm an Eagle Scout, retired Peace Corps volunteer, former Red Cross instructor for the EMT and first, uh, first aid responders, a former Big and the Big Brothers Big Sisters program, an active member in wildlife rescue, a youth mentor, and a volunteer for various other community and nonprofit organizations. None of that matters when trying to get help or even a response from a public representative of Washtenaw County. Over 10 months ago, I requested the release of the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Department's policies and procedures with reasonable exceptions for publicly accessible viewing. All but the 17 policies on the county website are deemed classified. I FOIA requested when those policies were posted on the county website, oh. that resulted in the county stating there are no records in this digital yeah, age, there are no records for when something has been posted on a government website is a blatant lie or gross incompetency by the county. Oh, so, we live in the 21st century and these out of date excuses are no longer even feasible or legitimate, yet they are still being given out as valid reasons for lack of transparency. Through the limited communications with representatives in the county, it was confirmed the Washtenaw Sheriff himself has final say on the release of Washtenaw County Sheriff's Departments. The only communication I was able to establish with the Sheriff was a short phone conversation where he directly stated he will not discuss this topic with me. I'm not allowed to call back and he then disconnected the call. Cable, the Civilian Oversight Committee for Law Enforcement of Washtenaw County failed to bring up my concerns in their November 2021 meeting, did not transfer over my unaddressed concern to the next meeting and no longer responds to my request for communication in any capacity. My multiple month long repeated attempts to establish communication with my county through the representatives on this council, the county administrator, corporate counsel, various county employees, various members of the sheriff's department and multiple attempts to speak with the sheriff have not come to any fruition or resolution of this issue. The lack of communication from the various aspects of my county has now required me to address this issue in a public forum as the only viable means of ensured communication. Here's my concern. Since the sheriff has final say in denying the release of public documents, why is there no policy or requirement of transparency on the sheriff to justify his personal decisions to deny the release of public documents? I am now asking for the help of this representative body to take actions to have the policies and procedures of the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Department be posted on the county website with reasonable exceptions for publicly accessible viewing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, I'm Libby Hunter, I live in Ann Arbor. I'd like to speak in support of teacher Barton who just was up here, uh, his effort to have the county sheriff's department's policies listed in full on the county website. And bravo to the Michigan State Police who recently did post nearly all of their policies on the state website. I'd also like to speak in support of a possible effort by all of you, our commissioners, something you might consider for the future, brainstorming and figuring out a way to evaluate our sheriff 
and all future sheriffs in our county. As of now, this position in our county has no evaluation, as you know. Um, so, and back to the list of policies, it's only democratic to, to have those policies on the website. In so many ways, it supports democracy, which I don't have to go into with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Greg Zabinski, I'm a township. I just wanted to thank Ramon Patel for his 61 years of service for the county and 51 years as the equalization director, as this evening will be his final equalization report. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Before I started speaking, I want to make sure I hand this to the clerk. Thank you. And there's an eight there. Um, I will give you number nine in just a second. My name is Monica Ross Williams. I'm a resident of Ypsilanti Township. And I'm coming back to this meeting in regards to something that occurred at this meeting on April 6th that was very disturbing to me to look and see. I'm going to start with the beginning part is that the commissioners started their meeting at about 7.03. At that point in time, public comments proceeded after the Pledge of Allegiance. After that point in time, there were three commissioners that were eating and drinking. Number one, Caroline Sanders, Commissioner Caroline Sanders was eating and drinking, proceeded to take off her mask at various times to do so. Number two, Justin Hodge was drinking, proceeded to take off his mask to do so. Number three, Katie Scott was eating and drinking and proceeded to take off her mask to do so, which was funny and disturbing. When Commissioner Jefferson started speaking during his speaking period, when he took off his mask in order to say that he needed to be heard better from before the public, that he was basically said he had a disorderly conduct, which I actually had to look up on the Michigan State Legislature site. I would suggest maybe each of the commissioners have a chance to do that as well. Also, in addition, I pulled up a, and I know this is not the Washington County Board of Commissioners, but a Garden City, Honorable City Council and um, Mayor meeting. It's specifically, if you look down on the second page at the bottom, it talks about disorderly conduct at meetings. And I'm not gonna read it, but you can read this part, which it goes straight to MCL 750.170 which corresponds with this, with the Michigan legislature. As, lo as far as I'm concerned, and I'm pretty sure most members of the public that attended that meeting, M Commissioner Jefferson did not do anything other than speak to the public, which is his right to do as a commissioner. So to have him basically accused of a misdemeanor before this body was unacceptable. It was completely unacceptable, to be completely honest. Last time I checked, the only thing that could have been possibly close to a misdemeanor, according to the state law, is a person that's jousting or, or roughly crowding people unnecessary in a public place. I don't think speaking does that to the public. That's his job as a commissioner. We pay him $27,000 a year to address the public. We also pay all of you $27,000 a year to treat each commissioner with a level of respect. Hopefully that will be done from this point going forward. Any other people wishing to make public comment? Chair, we do have uh, three in the Zoom uh, okay. meeting with their hands up. Thank you. First is Zach Fosler. Welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm just calling in because you have a uh, resolution before you tonight um, regarding uh, community violence and eruption. Um, I think it's very important. We have, um, I've been participating in this group uh, that was convened by the mayor of Ypsilanti to help reduce um, instance of gun violence in our community, um, specifically gun violence, um, really violence of all kinds, but we really need to reduce what we're seeing around gun violence. Um, and, and within our properties of the housing commission, um, we've certainly, we're certainly no stranger to it. Um, but I think what, what's really special about this approach is that, you know, what we're learning is very evidence-based and what we're learning is that it's not just about 
um, law enforcement to, to fix this problem. And it's certainly not just about community. It's, it really is a combination of the two. And I think that the initiatives within this resolution really address those. And so I, I just want to express my support um, on behalf of the Ypsilanti Housing Commission um, and my, myself as a, as a Washtenaw County resident. Um, and with that, that's all I got to say to you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Harvey Summers. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Harvey Summers and I live in Sio Township in Commissioner District 1. The Washtenaw County Criminal Justice Collaborative Council, the CJCC, has canceled its last six meetings and has not met since May 27, 2021, a year ago. The 2020 resolution establishing the CJCC set up quarterly meetings. In its initial January 2021 meeting, the CJCC actually voted to meet every other month. However, in 16 months, the CJCC has met only twice. Its initial January 2021 meeting for 45 minutes, and in May a year ago for 37 minutes. So I have to ask the question Is there a record showing that the multiple cancellations were done by CJCC majority vote as required by the establishing resolutions, Article 8, Section A, Clause 2? Next, the May 2021 meeting minutes have never been posted to the CJCC website, which violates the November 2020 resolution. I understand these minutes had never been approved, but the draft minutes themselves shall be made public as per Section G of Article 8, which says proposed minutes shall be available for public inspection not more than eight business days after each meeting. Now, Ms. Gordon from the CJCC has sent me my own copy, but how can we get the draft minutes available on the CJCC website for the public. And a very minor issue on the CJCC website, the 2022 meetings, this year's meetings are all shown, I'm sorry, five of the six are shown with a 2021 date. It'd be nice to get that corrected. In general, I wanna thank the commission for all the amazing work you're doing in so many areas, but I'm disappointed that the logical and even critical role that you apparently designed in your November 2020 resolution setting up the CJCC has not been fulfilled. I understand that much important progress is being made to make our county's criminal justice system more equitable, but without the CJCC playing the role you as commissioners envisioned in November 2020, are the developments underway in our county moving forward as effectively as they should be in as coordinated a fashion as they should be. And without the ability of the public to hear the proceedings of the body that should be bringing that progress together to be reviewed in a single meeting every two months, how can the public know? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Rosemary Linares. Welcome. Hi, good evening. My name is Rosemary Linares, and on behalf of my husband and I, Damian Rivera, we would like to thank the county commissioners for the upcoming resolution on tonight's agenda, which is to issue a letter of support for our upcoming meat and poultry processing expansion grant. And we'll be submitting this to the USDA next week. Over the past 18 months, we've had $120,000 in grant funds that has supported a comprehensive feasibility study, business plan, preliminary facility design, and food safety plans to launch a new USDA-inspected multi-species slaughterhouse in Southeast Michigan. We live in Sio Township in Washtenaw County, and we intend to launch this new facility within Washtenaw County. Uh, though we've made a lot of progress over the last year and a half, We've been on this journey, honestly, for eight years. It's been a long journey, and we're driven by our guiding principles and values for the humane and human and animal welfare, so a people-centered facility design with practices and culture that support the workers, as well as the humane handling and animal welfare commitments that we have honesty and transparency, so trusting in collaborative relationships with farmers, distributors, and consumers, 
Also our commitment to high quality products and packaging with unique flavor profiles, customized orders and appealing packaging that promotes the traceability of products as well as environmental stewardship. We want to honor our natural resources. And so we're committed to investing in regenerative practices and systems to conserve and preserve the environment. We're incredibly passionate about our local food system and we recognize your passion and support. We are deeply grateful for your support. Thank you all so much. Thank you. There is one more hand, uh, Lois Allen Richardson. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon or good evening um, to everyone. Uh, yes, thank you for that welcome. Uh, I would just like to speak regarding the resolution from the regarding the uh, violence intervention plan that has been very thoughtfully put together. Uh, it was, I believe it was last July that we were at an in, at a, an event and a young man had just been killed the day before, a couple of days before. And as I was at this event, I saw several people that worked with from agencies that worked with youth. And I know that they were all working as hard as they could, but yet we were still having uh, gun death after gun death. And I just approached them and asked if they would be willing to come together and let's work together rather than working each one in their own silo. And so we began to come together once a week and develop the plan that is before you tonight. I do believe that if we initiate this plan, we will see a drop in gun violence. And I believe that with those that we have working with us, that we would, might even see a complete ceasing of that. That is my, uh, my prayer and my heart's desire is that we would see an end to gun violence here in Washtenaw County. I want to thank, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanna thank community uh, director, for the sheriff's department, Derek Jackson. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been suffering, <clears throat> I've been battling a horrific sore throat all day. So if my voice goes, that's the reason uh, for taking on the job of facilitating this group. We have, our group has grown probably from maybe 10 people to now, uh, sometimes we have 24 that are part of our meeting. And we also have been bringing in young people that have in one way or other been affected by gun violence. We believe that this plan that is before you tonight will make a tremendous difference here in Washtenaw County. So I'm believing and asking you to, if you've already read it or as you go through it tonight, that certainly you will pass it so that we can begin to bring an end to the gun violence that we see repeatedly here. Um, there was a young man killed today in the city of Ypsilanti uh, around 11:15, and with because of a gun. So we need to get guns off the street. We need to get our young people in a place where they put guns down and work out their differences in another way. And I believe that this resolution and the parts that are in there will help us do that. Thank you very much. I appreciate your <clears throat> consideration and have a wonderful meeting. Thank you. Okay, um, next we have commissioner follow-up to public participation. I just wanna say, Thank you to everybody for, for speaking tonight. And then we'll move to uh, commissioner comments. I, I do have, oh, Commissioner Jefferson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. This uh, evening, I appreciate uh, my colleague from uh, the Ypsilanti Township area, uh, former trustee of the Ypsilanti Township, Monica Ross Williams, uh, for bringing the attention of the information that she brought to us and uh, the incident uh, on last uh, meeting. Uh, it has been a, a, a trying uh, incident that when I think about uh, with others uh, in this meeting, uh, doing the things that, that was said as far as eating and drinking, and then I'm singled out as taking my mask off for, for speaking because there was somebody in the audience that has a hearing 
uh, impairment and has been writing me in emails and also uh, some others have wrote, wrote me in emails from the county who work in the county saying it's difficult to hear me speak. And even as I speak now, I, I noticed the uh, IT is, is doing the best they can to raise the, the volume so that I can be heard. So that is what it's all about. I mean, it's nothing that uh, uh, is a, a disorderly conduct and therefore there is no reason for that to be said of, of my behavior, that my behavior was appropriate and when it comes to dealing with uh, personal individuals within the community, I'm gonna always uh, respect what they need and, and try, try my best to give them that. And so therefore, I thank you for coming today. Uh, I guess the, uh, the, the, the stopping the violence situation is, is, is occurred uh, in, in my district <clears throat> uh, within the last uh, year or so. Uh, people within the district who are involved with those who know family members, uh, community members that have been uh, victims of <clears throat> gun violence or have even perpetrated gun violence have been doing their best to make sure that the uh, the pathway of those individuals when the incidents happen change their direction and make it an effort to become a more productive citizen because the only thing that uh, can really change a person is understanding that person and so with the grassroots groups that are, that are within our community, spring felons, uh, women and men making change, uh, and there's others also <clears throat> that have been uh, at, the, at the front line of dealing with these individuals and have been successful in giving some of these individuals opportunities to change their lives. And so I continually uh, uh, hear of violence as, as Mayor Richardson said today, uh, there was a shooting today, Man, young man died. Uh, that is something that we can all get together as, as commissioners and find a way to uh, deal with this uh, public health crisis of, of our children being and our young adults being uh, murdered on a, on a regular basis. And uh, I really appreciate that being brought to us today. Uh, the group that put it together, I thank you for doing that. And uh, Mayor Richardson, thank you. That's it, man. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to note in regard to the, the mass conversation at the last meeting, there were no allegations of uh, disorderly conduct under the penal code. The, the, the um, behavior that we were discussing was uh, potentially a, well, a violation of our board rules that we all voted on. And so there was nothing, nothing criminal of, about uh, Commissioner Jefferson's behavior in any way, shape or form. The, the only thing was that it was um, a violation of our rules. And so um, I think we may need to have a discussion about whether eating and drinking in, in the meeting is as well. Um, but just I just wanted to set that to rest that there, there were no allegations of any criminal behavior whatsoever um, at all. So um, thank you, everybody. Are there any other commissioner comments? Okay, then we are going to move on to, um, we have several special resolutions today of honor. The first one is honoring Mr. Jim Drees. Um, and I'm going to pass that over to Commissioner Morgan, who um, is the liaison to the Department of Public Work. Or, I'm sorry. The Board of Public Works. Thank you, Chair. Um, so our water resources commissioner, Evan Pratt and I are, are very happy to present this. Uh, commissioner Scott is the new uh, liaison to public works, but I had the pleasure of serving with Jim for some time. Uh, and I will say as a, a personal nature, uh, we have a, a long history and friendship here. So I will hand it to Evan first and uh, for some comments. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, what if you hang yeah, on to that? Yeah, I'll model I, it I like to you. speak with my hands. Jim's <laughs> been a wonderful person to work with uh, for, for many years. Jim has volunteered for 36 years on the county's board of public works. He has uh, seen a lot and has mentored me in a number of ways that I greatly appreciate. As many of you know, Jim was also an employee of the clerk's office for uh, about 10 years or so, but he really has put in a lot of public service with the county. And I'd just like to give him 
uh, 20 or 30 seconds. You can all read uh, the plaque and what's there, and I'm, I'm not going to take your time up reading that out. Jim, you want to say a word or two? Okay. Uh, thank you, Evan. I'm, uh, I have a reputation of running short meetings, and I'm sympathetic uh, with you about the lengthy agenda you have tonight, uh, so I will keep it very short. First, I'd like to thank the uh, uh, members of the Board of Public Works WIP that I've had the pleasure of serving with over the last 36 years, the staff of the Public Works Organization and the Water Resources Department, who I've had the pleasure of working with for a long time. For the individuals who have served as liaisons to the Board of Public Works, I hope we've given you some insights. Uh, and then to each of you as the Board of Public Works of Washington County, who've given me uh, the opportunity for so many years of public service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. All right. We got a quick photo. Oh, up. oh yeah. Photo. All right. Oh, I got Oh, here, you're supposed to hold this. Stand up. <laughs> I should have worn the tie. <laughs> I'm smiling. All right. There yeah. you go. Thanks, right. Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Next, we have a proclamation recognizing Maria Militzer and Mexi Kent's on Michigan for receiving the Hometown Health Hero Award from the Michigan Public Health Week Partnership. And um, just to say, if, are you here? Yeah, I think you're coming up. Maria Militzer and Mexicans on Michigan have advocated for resources to ensure that the Latinx Oh, I'm sorry, Jimena, were you going to read it? Okay. Um, to ensure that the Latinx community in Washtenaw County had access to COVID-19 vaccination, COVID-19 home test kits, and personal protective equipment. And they are continually partnered with the Washtenaw County Health Department to translate critical information and create materials in Spanish and to have Spanish interpreters present at community clinics and manufactured home communities, restaurants, and places of worship in the areas most impacted by COVID-19. In addition to their usual programs and services to support the Latinx community in Washtenaw County, Maria Militzer and Mexicans on Michigan have created an extensive network of volunteers to contribute to the COVID-19 response efforts. And those efforts have resulted in over 3,000 Latinx and Spanish speaking community members of Washtenaw County receiving at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine through jointly hosted community vaccination clinics. And there's no disparity in first dose vaccination rates among those community members in Washtenaw County. And Maria Militzer and Mexicans on Michigan have worked with the Washtenaw County Health Department to distribute over 6,500 KN95 masks and 1,500 over-the-counter COVID-19 tests to Latinx and Spanish-speaking community members in Washtenaw County in early 2022 during the Omicron surge. And at their 20, April 22, 2022 meeting, the Washtenaw County Board of Health honored, appreciated, and congratulated Maria Militzer and Mexicans on Michigan for their service and receiving the 2022 Hometown Health Hero Award. And tonight we are doing the same. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for this recognition. I need to be completely transparent about who does the work and does the heavy lifting of uh, putting the Latinx community in front of you, their needs, their uh, challenges, their struggles. Uh, there is a group of people, uh, the leadership in Mexicanses in Michigan, who should be here. Uh, in front of me, but I have the privilege of finishing my working hours earlier today, and they didn't. So they are the ones who should be here receiving this recognition and being um, right here in this specific uh, precious place where perhaps, hopefully in the future, they'll have the opportunity to be. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, Commissioners. Maria wanted me to share who um, she's speaking about was so important part of the team of Mexicanses in Michigan who couldn't be here today. Uh, they include Nayeli Mena Martinez, Ana Trinidad, Arturo Cabrera, Consuelo Alvarez, Sonia Hernandez, Ellen Ward, and Adriana Salazar. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have a proclamation recognizing Washtenaw County Environmental Health Program Administrator Jacqueline Bates for receiving the Samuel M. Stevenson Sanitarian of the Year Award. She's not here. You're on, she's on Zoom. Okay. Ms. Bates, the Washtenaw County Environmental Health Program Administrator, was honored with the Samuel M. Stevenson Sanitarian of the Year Award at the Michigan Environmental Health Association 76th Annual Education Conference on March 23, 2022. Thank you. I'm glad we can see you now. The Samuel M. Stevenson Sanitarian of the Year Award is presented to recognize outstanding service to the Michigan Environmental Health Association and the environmental health profession within the last three years. Jacqueline Bates was promoted from sanitarian to program administrator in late 2019 after learning multiple environmental health programs. She quickly pivoted to support COVID-19 response work after just a few short months in her new program administrator role, including answering calls from the public, facilitating emergency environmental health response to homeowners who were left without water and family failing septic systems, and putting new processes into place to continue to assist customers safely when stay home <laughs> orders were in place and supporting mass vaccination clinics. Jacqueline Bates championed a massive software change for the environmental health division which included participating in countless planning meetings, performing beta testing and training staff. And she has learned the technicalities of the court system, working with lawyers for non-compliant sites and facilitating environmental health appeals through the Board of Health. So it is therefore proclaimed that the, I'm sorry, that was, um, so we are very grateful to your service, Ms. Bates, and we are, um, Congratulating you here tonight. Thank you. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you very much for the recognition. Um, I would like to thank my uh, manager and coworkers who nominated me. I give all credit to the great team that I work with and the very supportive department that I work for. Uh, thank you very much again. And I promise that I'll keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Our Corporation Council is now going to introduce our um, new Assistant Corporation Council. Well, if I didn't have my mask on, you would see a huge smile on my face right now because this position has been vacant for 805 days. <laughs> <laughs> so excited you're here. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Michael Otten as our new assistant corporation counsel. He is coming to us from the city of Detroit doing litigation for the city. So he's been doing that for about five years. He is a local, um, he's a U of M grad, undergrad. He went to Texas Tech for law school. And he is now a Washtenaw County resident um, in Commissioner Hodges district. And him and his family, uh, who he is with tonight, they operate a small farm as well. So in addition to being a lawyer, you're also right. a farmer. <laughs> um, so I just wanted you to be able to say hi to him tonight and introduce him because I'm so thrilled he's um, finally here. Thank you. It's a, a privilege and an honor to uh, have been um, to get this position. This is a dream come true for me. Um, I've said it time and time again, I wasn't looking for a job, but uh, when this one pop, pop, popped up, I could not pass it up. So uh, it's an honor to be before you tonight. Welcome. Thank you.
Next, oh, <coughs> Commissioner Labar. Uh, Chair, I just, well, uh, I was gonna offer if you wanted to introduce his family, but, oh. um, <laughs> but we, yeah, congrats. So. Bedtime. <laughs> Next, we are, we are going to take, again, another item out of order, a resolution adopting policy recommendations to save lives by interrupting violence. I believe uh, Derek Jackson is going to give the presentation. There you are. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Um, I would ask the folks who are in the audience who uh, are here to present with me uh, to please come uh, up to- Derek, just hang on one second, please, where we have to adjust the volume. We're almost there. I can also adjust it on my end if that helps at all. Sure, we're good, thank you. So <clears throat> if I can ask the people who are gonna present with me in the room to please join uh, us at the podium. I just wanted to say that uh, I woke up this morning feeling very ill, otherwise I'd be in the room. Um, but um, this conversation was so important that um, we don't really have time to waste and there was no way we were gonna not um, have the discussion today. So we will be brief, um, but as Mayor Richardson said, the uh, a young person uh, was murdered today. So that, if nothing else, should just speak to the urgency of the conversation we're going to have. Um, commissioner Richardson, you said it best. Uh, it's not about me. It's not about us and uh, the commissioners or about the sheriff's office. Um, although many people see me and think I just am representing the sheriff's office all the time, which I love to do. But this work, um, I was fortunate enough to just help facilitate an amazing community group. And so with that, I will be quiet and I will um, turn it over to Charles Peterson Bay and Florence Roberson and the people you will see uh, standing behind them are community members who have in some way or another um, been impacted by violence and are here just to show solidarity. Charles? How y'all doing? This is I, man, I never thought I'd be doing this. My name is Charles Peterson Bay. I'm here on behalf of the mayor's office and uh, Derek. About a year ago, we all got together because of the violence that was going on in the neighborhoods. And um, I came by way of Supreme Felons. To give you all the brief snippets of the Supreme Felons, we basically was a group of guys that was in prison and we came home, we decided that, hey, we ain't no war heroes. We, we, our problems out here, these things out here that's going out here, we help create these things. So right now, since we've been home, we've been out here dealing with this, these young people young brothers, we don't call them troublemaker, knuckleheads, none of that. They just uneducated and unloved. And it's a lot of violence. We don't have to sell this thing. I know we don't have, this is something that don't have to be sold. We all know that the community is bleeding right now. We got mothers that's losing their children right now. We lost one today. So Supreme Felons, our job is basically, we are the bridge between the law enforcement and the community. The law enforcement respect us through the sheriff's department because of the work we've been doing in the community. The community respect us because since we've been home, the things we're doing in the community. You know what I'm saying? So we are that bridge. All we ask for is to support, to push this so we can do something about these youth in the, in the community. And we need support. That's all we're looking for. We're not looking for nothing but the support. And um, the youth need it. We need to educate them. They need mental health. You know, a lot of things, a lot of stuff that's underlying things that's going on out here that that's not being spoke of, that we all know. And this is the result of it right here, you know? And, and as an as a, as a ex-felon, supreme felon, I can't sleep with it because I realized that I was one of the ones to help create this when I was that young. So the best way to reach them is the ones that have been that route. We know what they're going through. We know what it takes to get on the block and, and, and hold a pistol. We know what mentality you have to go through these things. So the, we know we, we are the community's mechanics. So I'm gonna leave y'all with that. I'm gonna leave it brief. Thank y'all. Flo. My name is Florence Roberson. I am um, the program coordinator for Sure Moms. I want to just give you some stats. I have five mothers whose houses between them have been shot up 16 times. I have five mothers who buried their sons. I thought one of the worst things in the world for me would be watching or standing near a mom who lost her son. It is a cry that you hear that you never unhear. 
this I thought was the worst thing, but the worst cry that I've ever heard was a mom who calls me and say, Florence, my son is going to get killed. Florence, my son is about to die because he's out there with guns and there's no help for him. I thought the cry of a mother's wailing at a casket was something. No, the cry of a mother who says to me, I know my son's doing wrong. I know my son is going to die on the streets. I need help. So when we can sit around and come to a place where we've got to decide that we've got to do prevention work, we've got to get these boys before they die. We've got to get the guns off the street because I'll tell you, and I'll leave you with this, there's nothing worse than a mother or grandmother's cry due to the death or knowing that one day it will be her son or grandson. So as you can see, thank you, Charles, Florence, and for everyone who was there. Um, I will be brief with just a couple of uh, slides. Um, I don't really need to say much more than that. The recommendations in the report speak for themselves, but the power of the group, the community violence intervention team that Mayor Richardson originally called together is what you see before you today of community members, elected leaders, uh, folks who have perpetuated violence in the past and people who have survived violence, all coming together to learn, to teach each other, uh, and to develop the 14 recommendations that you see before you. Just really quick, I just wanna offer three quick statistics. Exposure to firearm violence approximately doubles the probability that a youth will commit violence within two years. So the idea that a young person who's in close proximity to violence in Washtenaw County um, within two years is either a victim a second time or potentially a perpetrator the second time. This one really stands out to me and I think it says a lot and we see it in our everyday work. Hospitalization for violence related injuries is recurrent, which means hospital readmission rates for subsequent assaults. So someone's physically seriously assaulted, guns, stabbing, um, is as high as 44%, meaning that young person can come back. This is a staggering one. Homicides as high as 20%. What that tells us is if a young person goes into the hospital for gun violence, we know and we can predict the probability and likelihood that they will wind up deceased or arrested um, and at a future date. And if you ask yourself the question, what percentage of shootings in Washington County are retaliatory in nature, we are upwards of 85%. You put all three of those data points together and what that tells you is violence in Washington County is predictable. Gun violence is predictable. And if it is predictable, that means it is preventable if we come together and do the right things. I'm gonna slide through this and just say, here are the 14 recommendations. Uh, this is the very first time that we are publicly talking about these recommendations, although we have spent many hours uh, across the community having smaller conversations. So we thank the County Board of Commissioners for being our first official step, but we'll be doing this all across Washington County. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of quick ones. And the ones in orange are the things that you through the resolution are already doing. Number one, set a clear goal, commit to saving lives by stopping violence. It sounds like words, but when you make that a part of your primary existence and your goal, then you start to really think about funding in a different way. You start to think about um, the folks you hire in a different way. You start to really think differently about the nature of county business when stopping violence, gun violence in particular, is a focus area. Also in the resolution, um, number two, and, and everyone who's done this work around the world, and I will say that we've had experts who have been doing this work and been successful come to uh, our group and visit us, and they all talk about the very first thing you need to do is a problem analysis and an asset mapping. And I know in the resolution, you all are taking the step um, to ask the county administrator to do the research and potentially fund that work. Number three was really about creating a plan for engaging key people in places. And number four goes hand in hand with that, engaging those key people with empathy and accountability. Uh, Zach Foster said in public comment, this isn't about just law enforcement. It really is about both. There are enforcement things that have to happen. Anyone who's been successful at this work will tell you that. If someone shoots your child, there has to be accountability. If there are guns on the street that are being shot. Yes, there has to be accountability. But as you heard in the comments from Florence and from Charles, there's so much more we can do before that young person ever picks up a gun. And then number nine, you are also doing this in the resolution, 
I'm sorry, uh, you already done this uh, through the ARPA dollars by setting aside funding for new stakeholders and strategies. And I want to stress this piece. And, and, and I guess in some strange way, uh, me not being in the room and those community members who are on the streets really doing the work um, is really important because setting aside those funding for new stakeholders and strategies isn't just about our government systems getting those resources. It's about getting the money in the hands of the Florences, of the Charles, of the Marvins, of the Billies of the world who know how to do this work. And I have to talk about number 11, and then I promise we will wrap up. Um, number 11, because every young person we've talked to has highlighted this. The science and the young people say that we need a safe space for our young people. And if you talk to the young people, like we just did another session last week, they told us there's nothing for us to do. We need a community center in Eastern Washtenaw County. And they've been saying that for years, and the moms that Flow works with have been talking about that for years. Beyond just what the community is demanding and asking us to do, let's talk about the science. Any community that has solved and dealt with community violence that we've heard of and learned about and looked at the research, they have a safe physical space. So you have the science and the young people who are telling us we have to do that. And I just want to stress this piece because I've been working with young people in this community for years. I hope we don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I've asked at a, a recent, couple recent meetings um, at local townships, how can we haven't gotten over the hump to actually build a community center? To me, this is such an important issue. It's not the magic wand, but I believe if we listen to our kids, um, they know exactly what they want and what they need. I want to just share uh, one of the slides. I'm going to just go through these. They're in your presentation. These are just some of the um, points I was going to highlight. But there's one slide in particular that I want to leave you with. Um, as we, oops, sorry. So what you see before you on the screen are uh, the list of people who have been murdered in Washington County. Um, I often talk about this book that I carry for the last 14 years since I've been at the sheriff's office, every young person or person who's been killed by gun violence is in that book. And these names are represented on the screen. And there's a space up here there was a new name to add today. We don't know all the details of what happened to that, but I wanna leave you to sit with this as we open it up for any questions or anything that you would like to ask of us, because to me, this is really why we do this work and why we have no time uh, to waste. Thank you. Any questions that we can ask briefly before we um, let everyone leave. Hey, Mr. Jackson. Excuse me. <laughs> Good evening, sir. I um, see your documentation and it is very thorough and very thought out uh, on this situation in which we have uh, mothers uh, and, and people in our community that are losing their children. Uh, there's names that I recognize and there's also some of my family who have uh, been the victim of gun violence. Uh, one of the things that uh, I did back in uh, last year is I asked the uh, people who are here today, some of them, uh, Mr. Billy Cole and a few others, to convene a, a group to talk about the violence. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have to really respect, that is when people are released from prison, that they are people. They have lives, they have hearts, they have an understanding of what goes on in the streets. Uh, it's, it's not unfamiliar to me what goes on in the streets either. Uh, when I talk with them and uh, we got the talking about becoming a, a 501c3 and uh, they did that and, and they have been moving uh, and finding funding since then. I think this body here has a, a opportunity to bring about a Eastern County uh, situation that gives our young men and young women a location to where they can feel safe. Uh, talking with the uh, 
the grassroots groups, what the young men and women have right now are just studios where they go and, and they have the adults there to supervise them to make sure that they all stay safe. But that's not enough. I mean, we have uh, an opportunity to bring uh, insight to the gifts that each one of these uh, young men and women have within them uh, by increasing the opportunities to, you know, pre-apprentice training, uh, doing things that uh, can lead them to a college education, uh, to, to a career. Uh, those type of things have been lost uh, in our district, in our school district. So what I have seen and what I know works is not only the grassroots groups, but they are the, the front line, but our businesses, our schools, organizations within the, the city and within the township will benefit from less violence. Therefore, not only uh, is, is government uh, it has an opportunity to uh, provide funding for uh, a better community. And so does our local businesses. I've seen that model work in San Francisco. It's working real well. And it's led by ex-convicts. Their integrity, their moral, their moral way of living has given them the respect of the local businesses, the local government, to the point to where the building that they were leasing for the safe space where the kids have a place to go has now been given uh, $400,000 from the city government to purchase the building because they would have been gentrified out if they didn't own the building. So we're looking at something that's stable and, and consistent and sustainable for the uh, future for our children. I thank you uh, for your expertise in this, Mr. Jackson, and, and all of these who came today you know, my heart goes out to your families. Uh, it's not easy to hear this almost every week uh, of someone being a victim of violence. So thank you for this opportunity and uh, continue to do, do the work. And I believe that opportunity for this board is at hand. Thank you again. Thank you, Commissioner Labar and then Commissioner Sanders. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, Director Jackson, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for your work. Thank you most especially though to the, uh, to the community members, the mothers, uh, the family members who, who, who are here today. Um, I think sadly, uh, the recommendations you propose are necessary and, and, and that is a shame unto itself. But uh, I, I think this model of developing it organically and in concert uh, is, is, is to be emulated and celebrated. Uh, Director Jackson, though, the, the question I have is, can you expand just a little bit more on the discretionary nature of this funding? Because we talked at our, at our working session about some of those differences in terms of mandated services and, 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 and others. Uh, can, you, can you tell us just a little bit more on that? Yeah, absolutely. And sorry, you know, as we try to rush through just for time's sake, I think this is a really big piece. The recommendations themselves are really meant uh, um, in, the, in the report that we put the language specifically for individuals to buy into certain recommendations, for community organizations to buy in, for neighborhoods, and for government entities. So these are not mandates by any stretch of the imagination. These literally are what they uh, say, just recommendations. And if we could do some of these things, um, we might be able to have some significant impact. The other part I'll say to that is there are things that we don't even know because they didn't come up in our group. Uh, so we're not pretending that our group has all the answers. What we try to do is really put all of the information together into these recommendations to hopefully spur the conversation because there are many more than are on our group who are out there doing the great work. So, so to your point, uh, Commissioner, it is not mandated, it is discretionary. Um, and we would hope that whether it's the county, a particular department at the county, or any other government entity or community organization or individual for that matter, that as you look at these recommendations and read through the data, you have your own ideas of how to embrace one or all 14 and put that into work. Commissioner hmm. Hodge. Um, for sake of time, respectfully, I say thank you to um, the community for coming to share this with us. I'm going to pose my question to Mr. Jackson, if you don't mind. Um, 
Derek, would you be okay sharing uh, with us um, who some of your key um, public officials have been in terms of supporting these, your concerns and initiatives from the beginning? So who, who would you say um, were sort of your foundational supports um, to be able to make this presentation to us today? So I, I know you asked me, I'd be interested in the group's thoughts on this as well, but I would just say that, you know, Mayor Richardson honestly called us together for the original conversation. And that's all it was, uh, Commissioner Sanders. It was just a conversation because we were so devastated by three deaths of young people that happened in close proximity. And that conversation spun into what you see before you today. Um, I know that uh, Administrator Deal, uh, Commissioner Sue Shink, and Commissioner Hodge, all three have been attending regularly. Um, I also had some good conversations with Commissioner Jefferson. Um, and so I think um, we also had um, City Council member Brian Jones Chance from Ypsilanti City who comes and then uh, Jimmy Wilson who's a township trustee. So those are the elected and appointed officials um, who've been coming to these conversations. Thank you. Commissioner Hodge. I want to thank everybody for coming out and for your ongoing work on this. I mean, as uh, some of my fellow commissioners know, this has been a lot of work since August of last year. Um, Administrator Dill and Chair Schink and I and, and the group have been a part of working with this group um, week, on weekly meetings for two hours at a time. So when we look at these 14 recommendations, they didn't come about lightly. I mean, this has been a significant amount of work uh, and the, the work of the community has been incredible on this. I mean, the I think this group has been one of the most effective groups I've ever worked with in terms of the amount of effort that's put into it uh, and the quality of the, the content that's come out of it. Uh, th this is really needed and I'm glad that the county, and I'm hopeful that we will pass it, uh, but I'm glad that the county will be the, the standard bearer for this and lead the way with hopefully the local governments in our county joining us in this, in this effort here. And thank you again for coming. Thank you, anyone else? Commissioner Beeman. For the sake of time, I'll also keep it brief. I just want to thank you for, for your time, for your advocacy. Um, your voices really do matter, and the time you've put into this is, is just, I'm sorry, I'm getting old here. Um, it's, it's just amazing. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, and uh, look, look forward to, to continuing this work. Thank you. Since I'm chair, I get to go last. And Thinking about what I want to say, I, I start crying, so I probably will say less than I'd like to say, but there's, there's really nothing more precious than our young people's lives. And it's been an incredible honor for me to, to have been able to work with you, and I plan to continue working with you to do whatever we can to protect our, our young people's lives. And um, I'm not a person who often says that I love you to people, but I will say I love you because you are working so hard to do something that is difficult and important. And you, this, this group, everybody in this group has, has worked together through difficult times, difficult spaces, talking about just you know incredibly difficult issues, always with respect, always with a focus on the goal, always with a focus on using data and research and information that comes from outside of our personal opinions to, to do the thing that we all agree needs to be done. And I'm just so incredibly grateful for your work. And I want to do whatever we can to support our young people to support this work. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Commissioner, I, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say thank you. No, I was gonna say thank you. Just one last comment. I really wanna stress how strong these mothers are, how amazing and caring and loving they are of their kids and how um, smart and impactful these young people are. Um, and so I know sometimes we think about gun violence and say, oh, those kids are trouble. Um, it's much more than that. And you can look at Charles in the room because he shared part of his story and you can see the amazing men that they can grow up to be if we give them the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Derek, for leading this work with, with such grace and intention and information. Okay, with that, um, to our liaison reports. Does anybody have any liaison reports? Okay, we're order of business and Commissioner Labar is going to move that. Thank you. I actually had just one brief 
liaison report. So oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm moving too quickly. But but then I will. Mm -hmm. um, our last CMH meeting was was canceled. We did not have a quorum, and part of the reason for that related to the ability of somebody to attend the meeting in person. So I just wanted to flag that because um, th there's there are multiple reasons behind that, but it has been an issue. Uh, so heads up and, and, and please be aware uh, on the CMH front. Thank you. Any other liaison reports? All right, now moving to special order of business. I'm looking for someone to move that. One at a time and we will vote on each one separately. So move. Do you want me to? Uh, Thank you. Under special order of business, uh, item A, which is the public hearing uh, to receive comment on the proposed brownfield for 3874 uh, Research Park Drive. Uh, that is for uh, May 18th, 2022. We have a second. Mr. Mulcahy, can you please call the roll? Commissioner Beeman? Yes. Commissioner Hodge? Yes. Commissioner Jefferson? Commissioner Labar? Yes. Commissioner Machieski? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Schenck? Yes. Item passed. Governor May, then uh, item two, which is a resolution setting a public meeting to receive comment from the Washtenaw Urban County 2023 Action Annual Action Plan for May 18th, 2022. We have a second. Mr. Mulcahy, oh, any discussion? Sorry. Mr. Mulcahy, can you please call the roll? Commissioner Hodge? Yes. Commissioner Jefferson? Commissioner Labar? Yes. Commissioner Machieski? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Schink? Yes. Commissioner Beeman? Yes. Item passed. And Chair, item three, resolution setting a public hearing for May 18th, 2022. Uh, this is regarding receiving public comment on the proposed 2022 millage rate. We have a second. Second. Any discussion? Okay, Mr. Mulcahy, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Jefferson? Commissioner Labar? Yes. Commissioner Machieski? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Schink? Yes. Commissioner Beeman? Yes. Commissioner Hodge? Yes. Item passed. Thank you. Next, we have appointments. No appointments. Uh, would somebody be so kind as to move the consent agenda? So moved. Court. Any discussion? Okay, we can um, vote on the consent agenda with a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any against, please say nay. Motion carries. Report of the treasurer. Do we have one of those tonight? No. Um, item nine, resolutions. Could somebody please move the first reading resolutions? Or Chair, uh, move uh, first reading starting with A, which is a uh, resolution to adopt the brownfield plan for 3874 Research Park Drive. Uh, item B, which is a resolution to ratify the submission related to the National Fish and Wildlife Southeastern Mission Resilience Fund and the uh, Green Infrastructure in Ipsy Township from Water Resources Commissioners C, which is approving the purchase and installation of recording system for Washtenaw County 14A District Court. Uh, D, which is a resolution authorizing the creation of a risk manager position from Corporation Council. Uh, I, item E, which is a resolution reaffirming and adopting an updated deficit elimination plan for CMH for fiscal years 2022 and 2023. F, which is a resolution approving non-structural adjustments to the 2022 general fund budget. G, which is a resolution setting the 2022 millage rate at 6.8343 uh, mills from finance. Support. Any discussion? Can we vote on items for the first reading on a voice vote? A voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any against, please say nay. Motion carries. 
Next, we have a presentation on the Washtenaw County audit results from Stephen Bland, CPA principal, principal from Rabin Robin, Robson, sorry. Good evening and thank you for having me tonight. Certainly appreciate that. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to walk through a few of the financial highlights here, but I will jump to the bottom line first and just let you know this was a very clean audit, a very good process, and I'm happy to always share positive results. There are about two dozen reports that uh, we actually have included in your packet. I'm only going to refer to a few quick highlights from three of those documents, um, but if you have questions on anything else, I'll be happy to try to address those for you. The three documents that are most important from my perspective are the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report, or ACFR, which is what's currently shown on the left side of the screen. That's the biggest document, almost 250 pages, and it really takes all of Washtenaw County's financial information and slices and dices it a variety of different ways. You get to see the details on a fund-by-fund -fund basis. You get to see aggregate rolled-up information. You see um, pension history on the funded status of your plans. You see 10 years' worth of data in statistical section. There's just a lot of, a lot of great information in there. Probably no single person cares about all 250 pages, but uh, whatever you're looking for, you'll find it in there. And just about all the separate standalone reports that I'm not going to go over today are incorporated into this larger document in one form or another. The second document, which is on the right-hand side of my screen that I want to draw your attention to, is the single audit report. And this document has a, a couple of different important pieces of information for the County Board of Commissioners. The first is the auditor's results as it relates to our evaluation of the county's internal control. Our primary job on the ACFR on the left side of the screen is to issue an opinion on whether the financial statements are fairly presented, meaning are the numbers that are contained in that report, all of which came from the county's management, are those numbers reliable, something that you as elected officials can use to inform your decisions? And we've issued a clean, unmodified report on those financial statements. But as part of doing that, we have to look also at the system behind the numbers, the way Washington County accounts for its operations in order to uh, inform our overall audit process. And the single audit report gives us an opportunity to share with you the results of that side of the audit, not just the numbers, but the system behind them. And finally, that single audit report also addresses the results of our test of the county's compliance with all of the strings that the feds like to attach whenever they provide grant resources. So the county uh, received and expended a significant amount of grant money. That's true most years, but it's really been on the rise with all of the one-time COVID-related relief that has been uh, funneled through the federal government. And so there are a lot of different federal programs that get a very close look each year through the single audit process. And this is our opportunity to share the results of that as well. So that's kind of the quick overview. The third document is just the final um, nickel and dime recommendations, and I'll get to that last. So in terms of highlights inside this 250 page report, as I said, there's something in here for everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and jump all the way down for those of you who are following um, in detail to page 52, which is where we show the results of the general fund budget. So I've got the table of contents on the left. I've got page 52 on the right. I just wanna point out that the county had approved a general fund budget of about $124 million of revenue at the beginning of the year, or just before the year began rather. Over the course of the year, that was amended up to 128 million, and that's pretty much what was collected. On the expense side, the original budget called for spending up to 95, almost $96 million. That was ultimately amended up to allow expenditures up to $102 million. Actual costs came in under budget at about 92 million. So with revenues being uh, on target and expenditures being under, the bottom line is the general fund increased by about $3 million. You had a budget that allowed for it to go down up to 10 million. And so that $3 million dropped into general fund balance. Your general fund balance is now at uh, right around 37% of annual operations, which is well in compliance with your established policy. And those resources are available for you to appropriate in future uh, budgetary cycles as you go through that, that process. We know these have been very atypical times for government finance. Uh, there have been a lot of shifts in available revenue. There have been new revenues that have become available and a lot of difficult decisions on how to deploy those resources. So uh, having some flexibility and the ability to make um, well-reasoned and thoughtful decisions is certainly a positive for the county all the way around. 
Switching over then to the single audit report, I'm going to also jump well ahead. The uh, table of contents shows the part I'm going to take you to is page 17, and that's sort of the uh, overall summary of how the audit process went, and it's all good news. Here on page 17, we indicate an unmodified or clean opinion on the financial statements with no um, material weaknesses or significant deficiencies identified, either in internal control over financial reporting or in the county's administration of federal grants. So it's always hard to point you to what's not there, but a page that says there were no financial statement findings and a page that says there were no federal award findings, that's pretty good news to be able to share. Just so you know, we were actually paying attention. We do give you one other letter where we bring to your attention any small things that come uh, to our way over the course of the audit. And we have a few pages of boilerplate. And we came down to only one very, very minor recommendation. And, and frankly, I'm, I'm almost loath to share it, except the state makes us. Uh, we managed to find one bank reconciliation that was done accurately. It just wasn't done as early on the calendar as you would like. There were extenuating circumstances for that. And it ultimately did get done. It was just done after the, the deadline the Michigan Department of Treasury has set. And honestly, that's all I've got for you. It was really that clean of a process. And the fact that uh, management works so hard to account for your operations throughout the year, and that's all we're able to find, really speaks to the caliber of financial management you have at Washtenaw County. That was a lot of information really fast. I'm happy to give you more detail if there are areas you'd like to ask questions, or I can just get out of your hair and let you get on with your business. Thank you. I'm going to check and see if any commissioners have questions. Commissioners? Nope. Thank you very much. All right. We appreciate the opportunity to be of service. Yes. Thank you. Hope you have a good night. Um, now, um, Mr. Mulcahy, could you please um, ask Commissioner Jefferson about his votes for the three votes that he missed? For special of order of business number one. Yes. Special order of business number two. Yes. Special order of business number three. And yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to the single reading resolutions. Is anyone willing to? Thank you, Commissioner Labar. Sure, we'll start with A, which is the uh, proven, approval of the creation of human services program aid to support barrier busters. Uh, B uh, is approving the creation of grant status ARPA weatherization program coordinator in OCED. Um, uh, that is time sensitive, I know. Um, C, a resolution to approve substantial amendment to the 2019 annual urban county action plan to include CARES allocations. D, resolution to approve the budget amendment for Michigan State Housing Development Authority Rental Assistance Program. Uh, e, which is a resolution ratifying the signature of the county admin on the Michigan Enhancement Grant in the amount of $500,000. F, which is a resolution authorizing the grant from the Bank of America Foundation uh, to support the conviction, integrity, and expungement unit within the prosecutor's office. Uh, G, which is accepting the uh, Michigan DHHS grant for county jails COVID-19 testing reimbursements uh, for $773,000. H was a resolution approving uh, Washington County to be the custodian of the funds for the recycling quality improvement grant and application to action grant from Public Works. I, which is a resolution directing the Board of Public Works to update to undertake the North Lake Improvement Project in Dexter and Linden Townships. J, resolution directing the Board of Public Works to undertake the Lower Huron River Chain of Lakes Improvement Project for Dexter, Webster, Putnam, and Hamburg Townships. K, which is a resolution directing the Board of Public Works to undertake the Joslin Lake Improvement Project for the Township of Linden. L, which is a resolution authorizing county administrator to sign, accept, and amend the budget for the Michigan Department of Environmental Great Lakes Energy Eagle 2022 Scrap Tire Cleanup Grant. M, which is a resolution authorizing the above midpoint hire of Michael Otten as assistant corp counsel. N, which is a resolution ratifying electronic application for the Michigan State Court Administrative Office for the 2023 Michigan Drug, Drug Court Program. Uh, o, which is resolution approving the 2022 Equalization Report. P, 
a resolution approving the amended bylaws of the Community Action Board in the office in the office of OCED. Q, a resolution amending the bylaws of the Washtenaw County Commission on Aging. R, resolution adopting policy recommendations to save lives by interrupting violence. S, which is a resolution to support state action repealing Michigan's quote, no fault auto insurance reform 2019. T, which is a resolution calling the Michigan legislature to support Michigan municipal and county clerks in their electoral responsibilities. U, a proclamation of appreciation for Jim Grease for his service to Washtenaw County Board of Public Works. V, a proclamation recognizing uh, Maria Militzer and Mexican Nest in Michigan for receiving the Hometown Health Hero Award from the Michigan Department, excuse me, Michigan Public Health Week Partnership. Uh, w, a proclamation recognizing Washington County Environmental Health Program, Jocelyn Bates for receiving the uh, Stevenson Sanitation of the Year Award, excuse me, Sanitarian of the Year Award. Uh, X, which is a resolution proclaiming May as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and the May 9th through 16th uh, week as Taiwanese American Heritage Week and celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Taiwanese American Association. Y, which is resolution authorizing submission of the Damien Craft Meats application to USDA Meat and Poultry Processing. Z, which is a resolution instructing the county administrator to develop a report on options for affordable housing on the vacant surface parking lot, the corner of Ann and Main in Ann Arbor. Uh, and then I would include under uh, the supplemental, uh, and this is a first for me, Corp Council, uh, item A, A, two A's, a uh, resolution supporting 2% structural raise for members of Ask Me Local 3052 uh, and the creation of the uh, accretion issue. And then what I will dub AB, which is the, uh, I believe, uh, the abortion rights resolution uh, that we were provided with. And I think that, I think that concludes the items, Chair. Support. Does anybody wish to pull any of the items to separate consideration? Commissioner Scott. Yes, I'd like to pull item AA. Okay, any other items? Okay, um, as part of this, um, so I guess I'll ask if there's any discussion, but say before we move on to discussion, that is part of this batch of resolutions, which was made longer because of the cancellation of our last meeting due to a serious security concern. Ramon Patel is going to give us um, an equalization report. And so I'd like to start with that report and then move on to, to further discussion. Okay. Welcome and thank you. Madam Chair and members of the board. Today, I'm proud to present for your review, Washtenaw County's 64th <laughs> Annual Equalization Report, which will be my 51st and final equalization report of my professional career. I'm grateful for the opportunity that Washtenaw County has given me as an immigrant from India my very first professional job in America was with the Washtenaw County. I have poured my whole life into service to this county, and I hope that I have been trustworthy administrator in the uniform and equitable equalization of the property value. Although it is tied to revenue, the goal of assessing an equalization is not to generate the more or fewer tax dollar. Instead, it is intended or accurately measure market value using, using the uniformity and equity in assessment. This is our statutory responsibility. Our duty is to fairness extend beyond the Washtenaw County government and to the other taxing units in receiving the exactly their fair share in a tax dollar by means of the apportionment report, which will be presented in November. 
I urge our county not to lose sight of this guiding principle of equalization. A county that neglects the equalization will sacrifice the thorough and uniform measurement of the property value and thereby restricts its own tax base. Furthermore, an equalization department that allows itself to be influenced by other pressure will go against its own lawful responsibility. I would like to thank our present and past commissioners, administrators, county treasurers, county clerk, supervisors, assessors, board of review members, and associates in equalization office for their support. Now I'm gonna present to you my recommendation for the 22 equalization. Now, before I present to you equalization report, the report which you have in front of you, it is a condensed version of the report that has only totals. Actual equalization report, if it goes to the state, it is 121 pages in it. That 121 pages is nothing but the calculations by city by city, by township by township, by classification of the property. So just let you know, this is the official copy I will be sending to the county clerk's office for the record. And this happens for every year. Since department started 64 years, I'm the second equalization director. And this is the process and procedure we always have used in our county. But if you like to see more detailed work, nothing but the data is always available in my office. So let me start with my recommendation to you. I'm recommending agriculture property be set at the 569 million, which is gonna be increase of 2.89%. Now, there's a difference between equalized value and taxable value. Board of commissioner has a right to only equalized value. You don't, there is no equalization involved in a taxable value. Taxable value is a merely a calculation. And that calculation goes directly to the local assessor and state. And that calculation may be used for the Hadley fraction and all other things, but there is no approval required for the taxable value by the board, okay? Second recommendation is a commercial value. I'm recommending 5.5 billion, which is 4.79% increase. Industrial, I'm recommending 612 million which is a 5.22% increase. Residential, which has a highest percentage in our county, which is 18 billion. That increase about 762 million, 4.41% increase. Developmental is a transfer of the classes. So it has a loss on a 7.22. And personal property, we are recommending 1.2 billion this year it is a 17 billion increase, about 1.4%. So total county equalized value. I'm not talking of the state equalized value. I'm not talking the assessed value. This is the county equalized value. I'm recommending 26 billion, 37 million, 710,199, which is increase of 4.31%. This is our county equalized value. 64 years ago, we started with 1.5 million. Today, we have a 26 billion, and that been between the two directors so far in a 64 years. 26 billion means 52 billion in a market value in our county. That is our county valuation. That does not include exempt property. This is only ad valorem tax. This is not a special tax, ad valorem tax only. And a special tax means there is no IFT, CFT, and all those included in it. And this is our responsibility as a board commissioner and equalization director to equalize the county. This report goes to state, and they're gonna check this one, then it becomes the state equalized value. If there is a problem, then it's come back to the county board of commissioner, then county board of commissioner and equalization director decides what to do about it. 
and let me share some history on the past. It has happened in our county. We have gone to the tribunal. We have gone to the court of appeal. We have gone to the Michigan Supreme Court. It has taken the three years to resolve the problem on equalization. I see that sometime you got 10 minutes to do the equalization. I have seen equalization. Board of Commissioner has to come back for three continuous days to resolve the equalization. I'm just giving the, because it's the last year for me, I'm giving you some, the, the history behind it. Because right now everything is working so good in our county with the local unit of government and us. So we are coordinating everything. So there is no dispute in the valuation. Otherwise that could be a dispute between assessed value, total assessed value and total county equalized value. That could be a dispute between the county equalized value and state equalized value. This is the checks and balance system. Okay. So let's move on to the second slide. This is the 10 years of history. You can see that our equalized value is going down a little bit in the 2022, 4.3%. In the 21, it was 4.47, and before that, 6.53. Now, I expect that you're going to see some impact in the future year too. But that doesn't mean that your taxable value is going to go down. Those are the two different process and procedure. But our responsibility is only the county equalized value. Okay. Now, next slide is our new construction. You can see that our new construction has gone up 561 million this year. And that is the 50% of the market value. If you double that, that is the market value. So you see from 21 to 22 has gone up quite a bit our new construction in our county. Next slide is the percentage of the county total. Now you see that right now is a 68.98%, 69% of the properties are a residential property. Every year it increases. <clears throat> and the rest of the percentage are right there on the slide. You can see that. Now, look at the next slide. The average residential sales price. Now, look at the 10 years ago. 10 years ago, 175,872 and 178,998. Look at the today. 430,000 on average sales price in 10 years. It's more than double. That is our county. In 10 years, I double the prices. Now, this ends the equalization. Now, the rest of the information I have, because I have available here, and also it has labeled over that it's a tenative because this taxable value can always change. It depends on uh, what happens to the state level, okay? So that's why I have labeled the taxable value. Also, I get so many telephone calls because there are almost 78 unit of government, they like to see their taxable value and equalized value, including our county. They are no different than other unit of government. They get the same telephone, we get the same telephone calls. So I'm trying to help everybody as much as I can so they can start preparing the budget. Our county has to upgrade, update their budget. They don't have to start preparing the budget, but the rest of the unit of government, all our schools, all in Indian major school district, they all are looking for this information and you will see tonight it will go on our website and they all will be collecting and some of them may be watching tonight too. The next slide, you see the taxable value. Now, you notice that our equalized value went up 4.3% and our taxable value went up 5.80%. And sometimes people are going to be asked the question why that happened. It generally is lower than equalized value, isn't it? But we got the higher new construction this year. Okay, we got a lot of uncapping. 
That's why you see the reduction in our millage rate. So we are benefiting because of the higher taxable value. Plus also same time, we are reducing the two and a half cents on our general fund millages too for the county. Not even the county, but there are a lot of schools and everybody have a reduction in the millage rate. Okay. The next slide is a board of review action. We have about 1,000 tax per appear in front of the board of review. 762 application being granted. We reduce our assessed value by 78 million. We reduce the taxable value by 58 million. This is the county wide. Poverty exemption, 462 tax per applied for it. Poverty exemption granted 455. Disabled veterans exemption also 383 and has been reduced taxable value by $42 million. Now, next slide, you see that on the left-hand side is equalized value. Again, it's a county equalized value. And right-hand right, right -hand side is a taxable value. You can see the township by township and city by city, we have, we have to distribute this to them. And tonight, they're going to see all this figure. Generally, in the last 64 years, we do not release any figure unless until it is approved by this board. That is the rule. Okay, so because you have, because you can change any time the county equalized value. You have a right to do that. Or any city township comes in front of you, which has a legitimate request or anything like that, you can reduce and increase the equalized value. And that has happened in the past. That's why we do not release any information unless until it is approved by the board. Okay? And I hope it does not happen in the future too. Make sure that board of commissioner request for everybody not to release any information until it is approved by the board. Because you're gonna have a mess in this county if you do that. Because you can see the data, how much data goes through. This year, total levy in this county, the first time is going to be $1 billion. Now, if you wanted to have a smooth transition and smooth run out in this county, you have to be very, very strict about it. Otherwise you're going to start all over again. So, I'm going to show you further slides on this one, how important it is that you have to do by statutory deadline, everything, okay? Now, the following slide, you show all the schools. All over 19 schools, they wanted to prepare their budget. So they just go, go ahead and uh, prepare the budget, getting the information from. There is a second report, which I have not brought in here, is the Hadley Reduction Fraction. Each and every governmental unit have a different reduction fraction, just like county has. Same thing with the community colleges, same thing with the intermediate school district. You see all the villages, they have their own budget. All the authorities, all the libraries in our counties. These are the massive data and has to be distributed properly. The next slide is IFT and CFT. IFT and CFT means that commercial facility tax and industrial facility tax. These are not the ad valorem value. Okay, these are the special value. So we do collect on those valuation all the property tax, but this is on the top of the ad valorem property tax. Board of Commissioner are required to equalize the ad valorem property tax not the special tax, okay? DNR property. There are some DNR property in our county, which has a $11.1 million, and we collect that too. The next is a rehab property. We have only one property in the Washington County, which is in Ypsilanti City, has a 1.4 million uh, taxable value. And the next slide is a CPI consumer price index. That's the definition 
which you can read that later on. Now, here the CPI number, how the CPI number been calculated. Now I expect this CPI number may go higher next year from 1.33, probably more than 1.33. I don't know what the number is going to be because still we have to wait for the few numbers before we can say next year. And if the CPI number increases, there are chances that taxable value may increase too. And you see that uh, difference this year on the taxable value because of the higher CPI number. Last year was only two point something. This year is a 3.3. .3. Also, I want you to remember one thing that CPI number, according to the constitution, never going to be higher than 5%. So if the CPI number is 9%, don't expect that we're gonna have a windfall here. Everybody has to cut down at the 5%. That is in a constitution. So no matter how higher CPI goes, property tax never gonna be higher than 5%, all right? The next slide is a county slide. This is the way we have calculated the county reduction fraction. So you can see that last year we levy 4.37. Now it's going to be 4.35. That is our millet. Now, if you folks decided to, well, Ramar, we don't like 4.35. We wanted to go back to the 4.37. It used to be before proposal A, before 1994, you folks can raise the hand and you can go back to the 4.37. Now, there are so many races who hadn't been raised. Now, you have to go to the voters to have that. Okay? That is the only restriction they have put. And there are some other restrictions. This is the one of the restrictions they have put on a proposal A. So if you wanted to go back and overwrite the Headley or go, but it's not going to be overwrite, still is going to be new millages. Okay? So that is the requirement. Once you get the reduction fraction, that's it. That's the way the final number is going to be. Now, next slide is that you can see the history. Since 1959, that was our first equalization. My boss, George Kashi, was the first director, and he's the one who equalized first with the $562 million. That was first equalized value in our county. Now, today is the $26 billion in Washington County. Okay, next, next slide is just, just a graph. You can see that 64 years of history. This is the gap between SCV and a taxable value. We used to levy on a taxable, uh, we used to levy on equalized value and a such value. Now we levy on a taxable value. That is the difference. So if you see the difference between those two, you see the 22.20% that the savings for the taxpayer in Washington County. Before 1964, we have to, we have to levy on equalized value. Now we levy on a taxable value. So we all our savings, our uh, tax, about 22% tax savings on uh, each and every household and commercial property in Washington County. Now, next slide which I have shown here is a county revenue. Generally, you, uh, I have not shown here for each and every governmental unit, but this is the county revenue. You can see that is, we started last year with 19.1 billion. This year is 20.2 and we have to add all these other special tax in it. So finally, you can see that this year, our county revenue has went up 5.12% this year. 5.12%, which is a $4.3 million new revenue coming in. On the top, also, you see one more slide on the bottom. It says that in addition, the personal property reimbursement summary report will be filed with the state by May 31st. I have to file the report 
which is a part of the equalization, which is the loss of the personal property, which you don't see here. But that's where we calculate all these losses, what we have in equalization report. I have to file that report to the state and you will get close to one more million dollar this year. Maybe one million dollar. So total revenue, I expect this year is going to be around $5.3 million plus minus. That is our revenue this year. All clear? Now, next slide, which I showed, this is the last year slide. And you see the last year we levy in this county 955 million. And I expect that, that this year is gonna be more than billion dollar in a property tax in this county. Okay. So Madam Chair, only thing I can say to you that we got $26 billion SEV, $1 billion in a property tax and 200 and some villages in the Washington County. Board, County Board of Commissioner has hand over to me responsibility in the past. I'm handing over back to you, whatever I could done. That's all my report here. And if you have any question, I'll be glad to answer to you anything. Thank you, Mr. Patel. You have been a trustworthy and honorable equalization department director for many, many years, since um, 60 years. It's incredible. <laughs> I'm sorry, 51? 51. 51, it's incredible. Thank you so much for your service. We appreciate your many years of doing this important work and appreciate your very comprehensive presentation tonight and wish you the best in your future endeavors. Does anybody have any questions? No, I think we don't. Thank you again so I, much. I really appreciate it, uh, Madam Chair. I have assisted about 90 commissioners so far and uh, four county treasurers three county clerk and many, many assessor and supervisors. And the uh, thing is that everything works very smooth if we have a trust between the local unit of government and a county. That is a must, you must have that. And leadership goes from, from your board. And we have maintained that in the past and he has worked out really good, otherwise, we had our fight in the 70s and 80s. You don't want to have a history repeated again, in my opinion. Uh, everybody wanted to do the good job. And another report that I wanted to share with you that uh, there is a state law requires in the last three, four years that every governmental unit in their assessing department has to meet the minimum requirement of the assessing. And I have to I'm proud to report to you with the cooperation with the equalization <laughs> staff and all those things. Every governmental units in Washington County has passed that audit. So all the assessing function in Washington County is doing very well. So you don't have to worry about missing the value or anything like that. And it has worked very good in our county. If you compare our county with other county, we are the number one county in the state of Michigan. And I hope, Madam Chair and members of the board, you appoint somebody in the future such a way that have a continual legacy for everything because it's going to be a billion dollars in a property tax revenue. That's all I can say to you. And thank you very much for everything that you've done for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going back to the long list of resolutions that were moved and seconded. Um, one was pulled, AA was pulled for separate consideration. Is there any discussion on the other resolutions? Commissioner Morgan. Thank you, Chair. I will uh, keep my comments brief and orderly here um, for efficiency. Um, I did want to comment on item E uh, regarding the mental health deficit. I would like to see us, um, so this is just maybe a note for county admin. 
I'd like to see us explore whether we can pay off this debt or free up these structural dollars with non-structural dollars now that our budget is doing pretty well and CMH's budget appears to be doing pretty well because we have structural dollars tied up in paying off the deficit uh, in the tune of a couple million dollars a year. So um, something I'd like us to just take a look at uh, if that makes sense. Certainly it might not make sense. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, so I wanna make that note. Uh, the second is um, we have the resolution approving a non-structural adjustment. I'd like to have some more discussion on that. I'm fine moving it through one, um, through the first reading tonight, but it looks like we're putting non-structural dollars towards the compensation study. I'm very happy if we need to put more money toward the compensation study, but it seems like that would be something that would need structural dollars for ongoing cost. Um, again, noting it now, don't need to answer at this point, but something that I hope someone can follow up with me on um, between now and the next meeting. Third comment on the creation of the barrier busters uh, position. I'm extremely pleased to see this and, and thank you very much to County Admin and to OCD uh, and, and to Peter on, on working on this and whoever else worked on it. I think this is incredibly important. It's something I raised in December and uh, Admin committed to bringing that back to us and you have. And so I appreciate that and wanted to acknowledge that. Um, the next item I positioned for uh, grant status uh, ARPA weatherization. I think that is phenomenal as well. That is a really important program. Uh, weatherization is not always the most exciting thing in the world, um, but I think is so impactful because it, it speaks to so many of our priorities at the county around the environment, uh, equity, and supporting lower income residents. So I think that is phenomenal as well. Um, the I think the last one here I have, oops, excuse me, is on the um, the funds to support uh, through CDBG uh, to provide business support, business service and support for low to moderate income businesses. This sounds like a phenomenal item as well, and I would just want us to, I would just want to learn more about that and figure out what we can do to highlight this and emphasize in the community afterwards because I think this is a an important thing to do to make sure that we're helping those businesses that perhaps were not um, assisted through our prior rounds of, of business funding. So those are all my thoughts, no questions or concerns, usually uh, all pretty uh, happy comments about the many, many items that are on our agenda tonight. So thanks to everyone for what I'm sure was a heck of a lot of work. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, any other discussion? Okay. Um, We'll vote on those and then we'll consider the item that was pulled for separate resolution. And this will be um, a roll call vote. Commissioner Labar? Yes. Commissioner Machieski? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Schink? Yes. Commissioner Beeman? Yes. Commissioner Hodge? Yes. Commissioner Jefferson? Yes. Items passed. Thank you. Next, we'll consider AA, the supplemental. Commissioner Scott? Thank you, Chair. Uh, on this resolution, I just would like to uh, make a motion to strike the last two sentences of the final, be it therefore resolved. So uh, I'm moving to strike if no resolution regarding positions can be found. The county and AFSCME 3052 agree to enter binding arbitration regarding these positions. Exempt from this arbitration are previously agreed upon positions not in the union. Any support? support. We need to vote on the um, on the amendment. Discussion and then vote. Yes, first we have to discuss the amendment and then vote on the amendment and then we can vote on the entire resolution. So this discussion is just around the amendment and then is there any discussion? Okay, we're ready for the, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Sanders. So when you say only around the amendment, I, I just needed a, I had a question of clarity because I don't assume that um, our residents understand um, or would understand what accretion means. I, I, I'd like some, just a definition 
for them to understand what that what that's about. Thank you. I, I, I'm happy to discuss what accretion means. Uh, uh, there are, if in the resolution language, you can see that what the 3052 was certified for who was bargained for in that union. And accretion just means that you look at positions that have been created and decide if they need to kind of accrete, I, I think very visually. So accrete into the union because those positions meet that definition. And so that's kind of a, a simple way of describing what accretion is. Okay, so just for clarity, we don't have any information that indicates that that particular number of employees asked to be included. It's, I don't have a particular number okay. at all in this resolution. I think the union has thought that there are positions that can be accreted into the union, which is why there's this final, be it therefore resolved that we have a committee that looks at the appropriateness of any positions to be in the union or not. That based on the language in the 3052 contract as developed who they were bargaining for in the 1970s. Okay. Okay. Okay, so any more discussion on the amendment? Okay, seeing none, then Mr. Mulcahy, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Machieski? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Standers? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Schink? Yes. Commissioner Beeman? Yes. Commissioner Hodge? Yes. Commissioner Jefferson? Yes. Commissioner Labar? Yes. Amendment passed. Thank you. Now, is there any discussion on the amendment as amended? I'm sorry. It's getting late. On the resolution as amended. Okay, seeing no discussion, uh, Mr. Mulcahy, will you please call the roll on the resolution as amended? Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Schink? Yes. Commissioner Beeman? Yes. Commissioner Hodge? Yes. Commissioner Jefferson? Yes. Commissioner Lobar? Yes. Commissioner Machieski? Yes. Amended item passed. Thank you. Next, we have approval of claims. No, I, Commissioner Lobar, did you move those? I can't remember anymore. It's been a while. You know, okay. I was, I was 28 deep. <laughs> so I, I, I move approval of claims. Four. Any discussion? Okay. Um, Mr. Mulcahy, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Schink? Yes. Commissioner Beeman? Yes. Commissioner Hodge? Yes. Commissioner Jefferson? Yes. Commissioner Labar? Yes. Commissioner Machieski? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Items passed. Thank you. Next, we have a report from the County Administrator on food insecurity map. Thank you, Chair, for meeting, Commissioner. Good evening. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, two items, they're both related. We'll try to be quick. Uh, I am pleased to introduce tonight to you uh, a project that we have been working on with many of our community partners. It's called the Civic Innovation Project. And uh, I'll, I'll read the definition uh, uh, and it's kind of complicated. It is optimization of mixed mobility solutions towards improving fresh food access in Washtenaw County underserved regions. And that's a fancy definition for leveraging drones and robots to connect food and our robust food network in Washtenaw County with uh, food insecure zones in our, in our community. There are six partners, I'm sorry, seven partners, the American Center for, Mo for Mobility, Airspank, Airspace Link, excuse me, they operate drones, the University of Michigan, 
Aerotropolis, food gatherers, Kiwi Box that operates, that creates robots, and Washington our county. Uh, I'm going to pause for a second to see if Commissioner Hodge, who is the lead from the county on this project, has anything to add. I just want to say it's been a really exciting uh, experience so far. Drones are certainly not my specialty, uh, but to figure out how we can go about tackling food insecurity while making use of uh, aerial drones and then robots, uh, the potential for us to be able to do that's been really exciting. So I've been very happy to be able to be part of this and to help bring in additional partners. I uh, really appreciate Administrator Bill's work and then Peter getting pulled in at the last minute because there was a lot of a lot of paperwork had to get done as we uh, focused on trying to get this grant application in. Uh, I'm hopeful that we'll get through the phase one of the grant, which will be $50,000. Uh, and then if we get to that, we will then go for the $1 million grant to actually do the project. Uh, so stay tuned. I think it's really exciting stuff and it would be a great tool for us to be able to get food into the areas of the county that need it most. Thank you, Commissioner. The other part of the, the report this evening is to formally introduce Camilla Cormani from our office. Uh, I know that you all have seen her. Uh, she has been with us since the middle of February. And uh, I'm going to introduce her now, but I, I just need to say that since she joined us as a temp in February, she's been phenomenal. We have given her several projects and she's done them with uh, a, a high degree of quality. And I think what you'll observe tonight is more of that quality. So I, I won't belabor the point. I'll just turn it over to her and say that we are so grateful to have you as a part of the team. Thank you, Administrator Bill. Good evening, commissioners. It is a pleasure to meet you all. For those that I have not introduced myself to yet, my name is Cami. Camelia is my real name, but I go by Cami for short. Recently, I was working with uh, Administrator Dell, and I put together a map of Washtenaw County highlighting our opportunity index. I'll get it up right here for you all. Thank you, Andrew. So as you can see here, here is a map of Washtenaw County and our opportunity index, the red zones. Ooh, sorry about that. Indicate the lower index. I have put together three distinguishable icons. You see the yellow icons here. If I can slowly zoom in. The yellow icons here, I wanted to put together as, I am so sorry. Uh, anyways, the yellow icons that I have up here, these are all types of possible places where you could get fresh produce, meat, or dairy. All farmers markets included. I have the big chain grocery stores, Myers, uh, Kroger. I also wanted to include, it was important to me to include also the multicultural stores, such as the Hispanic stores, Mediterranean stores, Asian stores, as well as the farmer's markets. You know, we have Argus Farmer Shop. Uh, I even included the farmer's market that comes out here in Carytown because I think it's important to get produce during that time. Um, I wanted it to also have farms. Wasson Fruit Farm right here located. I'm so sorry, this is lagging. But I do have Wasson Fruit Farm right here. You could get fresh produce. And another important aspect that I wanted to highlight on this map was, for example, I will show right here, Linden Township. As you see, there are no grocery stores, no religious worshiping centers, no um, community centers. So I wanted to add these red icons that border Washington County to show the possible food sources available outside of Linden Township. And I figured if I was doing Linden, I would just go around the entire border of Washington County. As you see, Pinckney has bushes that's close to some people potentially in Chelsea, Whitmore Lake, and also Ypsilanti. I wanted to emphasize the Belleville area. So some of our residents in Ypsilanti, if needed to, they could go to the possible food sources that we have available for them out there. Um, aside from that as well, we have 138 of these yellow icons. So like I said, farms, grocery stores, local markets, farmers markets, and then 19 red icons that border outside of the county. Next, I wanted to emphasize the community centers that we have. Again, my apologies for the Zoom. As you can see, we don't have many community centers. The only community centers that we have are located in Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor. 
So um, we have approximately 20 of them. They're in blue, they're kind of hidden behind everything else, but it's only in Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor. And lastly, as you can see the purple icons, which there is a plethora of them, we have, these are the religious worshiping centers. So aside from all types of churches, Orthodox, Baptist, Catholic, you name it, I have it. I also wanted to include Baha'i centers. I wanted to include mosques. I wanted to include temples and synagogues and places that you could, anybody wanted to go worship to, they could. So I have, for example, right here. Like here, right here, this is a masjid. And then near that is another Baha'i center. Ypsilanti is heavily populated with churches all over, which I think is great. You know, um, and from the churches, we have not just churches, my apologies, religious worshiping centers. We have a total of 213, which I think is awesome. So in all, in all, in total, all of these icons that you see on this map right here, there's a total of 371, not counting the red icons that border because they technically aren't a part of Washington County. And I think that overall with what uh, Administrator Dill is working on, I think this information right here on the map could be a great beneficial help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Hodge and the Commissioner Sanders. Just want to give a huge thank you to Cami for all the work that went into this. I, you know, I made the request that you make a map that had the grocery stores listed on it as part of what we were going to include in the application for the project. And then, in the same time frame that you, that we thought, okay, we're going to get a map that just has the grocery stores on it, we get this that has all these other really incredible uh, data points that's uh, I'm sure made our application a lot stronger. But to overlay it over the opportunity index, include places of worship. Uh, and everything else that went into it, uh, just phenomenal work and really grateful for the time that you put into it. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I'd love to have uh, an opportunity for all of the commissioners to receive a copy of that. Absolutely. Um, because I think that it would allow us to possibly add in some areas or um, locations that may not be included that we are aware of in our own districts. Yes, absolutely. That was one of the challenges. Good, good work. Thank you. One of the challenging things about this map, actually, when I first started it, I thought I was finished after, you know, two days. And then, you know, I showed Diane and she was like, no, no, you're missing this. You're missing that. And I worked with Crystal Campbell and she actually got in touch with someone in the city of Ypsilanti. And the mayor provided me with all verified churches that are in the city of Ypsilanti, which I thought was a great beneficial help. And from there, I realized I was missing a lot. Um, it was a lot of diligent work and diligent time. And I think I did get a good majority, but there is probably a few things missing, but I would love to send you all an Excel sheet and the actual map itself for you all to look at and to add and modify if needed to. If I could just add um, to what Cami had said, um, com um, Commissioner Saunders, um, what she will actually send you is the interactive map. So you'll be able to click on those icons and really drill down a lot better. We just have, you know, the technical issues um, presenting tonight. So thank you all for your time. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Morgan, I think you've got a comment. Hi, uh, I had just one question. When uh, you look at the, the data, can you... Um, turn on and off some of the um, icons. So like, can you look at, for example, just the grocery stores? Because what I'm thinking about is where can you actually get food from? Um, so I think the, like the, the churches are, are helpful and I think some of them do provide food um, and they have food pantries and things like that. But I also think about my district, um, a lot of folks think downtown Ann Arbor, great, you have everything. You do have a lot of things, but an actual affordable grocery store is not necessarily one of them that's that's walkable. You can go to the People's Food Co-op, which I love, but it's not exactly as cheap as as Kroger or Meyer or other places that I certainly choose to shop at more more often because I need affordable food. Um, but and so that's one of the things I think was where can you actually get food from and where can you get kind of more affordable food from. So um, one thing that I think is important about this map actually is I think a lot of people seem to kind of forget the multicultural stores that we have because a lot of these stores offer great produce for a very cheap price. 
And I think a lot of people could be intimidated at times to go to, for example, a Middle Eastern store to walk in because they might not think that they belong there. But all in all, if you walk in there, there, the produce that you need is there, the meat that you need is there, the dairy, whatever you want is there. And it's sold at a much cheaper price. There's another, I think local grocery stores as well, ZZ's Produce on Packard. It's a family owned store and it's small and it's local. So I think they sell it at a cheaper price as well. I think a lot of the times people tend to look at the more high-end stores like Whole Foods or like you said, like the People's Food Co-op, for example, you know, those are also great places to get food. But, you know, within that area, if we look at the map, I'm sure there's a local Asian grocery store nearby that offer the same thing at a much cheaper price. So I think this map is a good resource for also our citizens to look at. And I also have the addresses listed down as well. So they could go at their leisure and get the that is really insightful. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really, really great point. And I want to be clear, I love the People's Food Club. It's just not where I, I can do too. all of my grocery shopping or I will be much poorer. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. That is a really insightful point to look at uh, these other types of stores that people might not think of to do some of their grocery shopping. So exactly. thank you. Thanks, Drew. Thank you. Commissioner Beeman. Thank you. I appreciate all the work that went into this. Um, one question I had, and I didn't see it because we kind of went east versus west is our stores that aren't traditionally grocery stores included in the map for example in my district we're more rural and it's not always wanted but the dollar general moves in and our dollar generals have expanded to have greater grocery sections understanding that that's a need in our community so were stores like that included or more just specific so the hardest parts for me actually were the rural sections. Because of that, I added the farms because I also added local bakeries that would sell fresh bread. You know, I would include all stores, even if, you know, I added berry farms. Would a berry farm have meat? No, probably not. But I think it's important to know to the public that you could get produce here if wanted. And they probably do have fresh dairy at the berry farms as well when you want to go in. Maybe, no, <laughs> like when you want to check, I don't know, naming the ones I've been to. But like I was saying though, um, I, I did not include the Dollar General or anything like that. Um, but I think that's what, what's best about this is for you the, to look at it and you could add, because I know Andrew's also from Manchester. It's difficult to look through those areas. And I tried my hardest and my best, but I think that's what's best about the public so they can also modify it. Thank you. Commissioner Haas. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to circle back to Commissioner Morgan's question. Because uh, um, part of the question, I think, was, are you able to toggle, um, Commissioner Morgan, uh, you, you asked if you could toggle the different um, data points. And it's in the same GIS platform that we've used for other things. So yes, uh, you can toggle the, the data points. All those other, when you look at what we just saw, those uh, locations are on there because that's what we were looking for for the, the project. Uh, and thinking about where, like drop off locations for the drones, for example. So you could easily turn some of those off. Awesome, awesome job again. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating and important. And I'm excited to see those drones. Yeah, so, so thank you, commissioners. Uh, we, you've heard so much about this work. Uh, I was so pleased to see the end product and see it uh, real time. It's, it's very, very interactive and, and it, it gives us the ability to do much of what you guys are, are talking about. The last thing that I want to say is we often get questions about how are we really leveraging the opportunity index. Now we can point to one of the ways that we're using the opportunity index to drive change in our community. Uh, and I'm really excited to see this from beginning to end where we take uh, uh, farm to table produce and move it to uh, those areas that don't have grocery stores, et cetera, and use robots and drones to make that happen. Perhaps we're on the cusp of making food insecurity a thing of the past in Washtenaw County. So I just want to say thank you. Cammie, uh, thank you so much for your work. Uh, we'll get this out to you and, and certainly take feedback on it, but I think it's an excellent tool for us to use. That concludes thank you. Report. Next, there's a report of the Chair of the Board of Commissioners. I just want to say um, that I'm grateful that this meeting has gone as well as it has. Thank you everybody for your role in making it go so well. And that is all I have for that. Um, item 12, items for Q Q
sorry, current or future discussion? Commissioner Labar. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say uh, or ask uh, a, apology from some of the department heads and uh, office holders in terms of some of the confusion around uh, the the accretion issue these these last few weeks. Um, I, I feel like I personally, just from experience here at the board table, um, should have thought in a more analytical way about some of that and uh, just wanted that stated for the record. I know that they have particular, our, our elected office holders, uh, the hard practical job of managing entities of, of, of county government along with the additional burden um, you know, being responsive to the to the public as an elected official, and conversely, you know, department heads have to make things work, and, and don't have the leverage and authority, frankly, with that elected officials do have. Uh, none of that was ill intended, uh, but I, I just wanted to note that. And chair, I appreciate your work these last few days, particularly in terms of um, getting us all rowing in the same direction. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Labar. I second what you just said. Um, any anyone else? Commissioner Hodge. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to thank Commissioner Labar for moving a list of items that goes beyond the alphabet <laughs> and doing it so well. That's all. On the NC. Anyone else? Commissioner Beeman. I just had a point of clarity. Did we vote on supplemental AV? Yes. Was that included? Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Scott. I'll say something about supplemental AV um, and because it just went in with the, you know, ginormous list and we didn't pull it for separate consideration, recognizing it, it was a long night and not wanting to do a lot of talking about it. But I think it's an important resolution um, to signify where we stand as a county board of commissioners uh, on row and what may happen in Michigan with um, I, I like the way people refer to it as a zombie law um, because that's yeah. certainly uh, what it is coming towards us. Uh, if the, when the leaked decision about Roe v. Wade comes out and one of the things it does is authorize our chair to sign on to different amicus briefs that would be presented to try to help preserve the right for uh, reproductive freedoms for, for women and people who need those services here in Michigan. I feel fully confident that as a county, we will continue to try to think creatively about what we can do to help women be able to still access these services. And um, I know that I, for one, and I believe probably everybody on this board is committed to making sure that we continue to help women no matter what happens uh, with the Supreme Court decision coming in a few months. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Scott. Um, to follow up on what you said, uh, I have been talking with Michael Steinberg of the ACLU and University of Michigan Law School about um, potential avenues for um, having an impact in this area. So more to come. Anyone else? Okay. All right, next then. Um, Anything pending? No, nothing is pending. And uh, oh, I have a motion for you, Chair. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Commissioner Scott, what would that motion be? I have a motion to adjourn the meeting. Support. <laughs> <laughs> Yay.